So one of the nice things about being a member of the Toronto Zoo is that you get early access to the panda exhibit. It's currently 8 o'clock. The zoo actually doesn't open till 9. So, uh... I can't tell if this is in frame because the viewfinder is facing away from me. So, yeah. Uh, unlike a couple of weeks ago when I was here, uh, there was about a two-hour wait to get in to see the pandas. Now there's nobody. It's great. Okay, so I'll be back in a few minutes with some uh, video of some pandas. Talk to you later. That is a lot of bamboo. And that's per day. This is the female. Good morning everyone and welcome to our giant panda exhibit here at the Toronto Zoo. So we do have two giant pandas here. We have our female Ursha. She's actually down in the day room. She decided it was much better inside today. So that's cool. Let the pandas do what they want. And um, that one's just out here enjoying his breakfast. Now pandas are extremely cool creatures. They do have a lot of adaptations that do help them eat their bamboo. And they do have to eat a lot of it in order to survive. Because it doesn't actually give them very many nutrition. Now they do have a carnivore's digestive system. They are technically an omnivore. However, they do specialize in a mostly herbaceous diet. Here at the Toronto Zoo, we do feed them anywhere between um, 90 and 140 pounds of bamboo each and every day. It's about 50 kilograms. So that's like you. Um, Your weight. They eat a little bit less than that, as they are very, very picky eaters. Now, pandas actually don't have the best eyesight, so they do actually rely very much so on their sense of smell. And they're very chemically stimulated, so they, they do sniff their bamboo and they eat the ones that smell the best. <laughs> However, if you guys were to eat life. broccoli, you'd only eat the greenest broccoli, and then that would be it. Now, in the wild, pandas do tend to be quite solitary. 
So they do live pretty much by themselves for the majority of their lives. They do bump into each other on occasion though, as their home ranges are quite small. They're about 5 to 15 square kilometers as opposed to a regular bear, like a polar bear or a grizzly bear, who actually have home ranges that are about four to five times that size. However, they do, uh, once they meet each other, they do keep going and live quite a solitary life. Now, they will also come together during the breeding season, which is always late winter, early spring, generally around March. And the female will actually go into estrus for only three days a year, so anywhere between uh, 24 and 72 hours. And then she's only actually able to conceive for about 12 to 24 hours. Now pandas actually have a really cool adaptation for helping the species survive. They generally will actually give birth to twins. However, the mother is generally only uh, able to care for one of the twins, so the strongest of the two would actually survive in the well. In captivity, however, we do help them out. We would hand raise the second cub, of course. So their favorite treats are apples, like us as well. Just rolling around here. Probably going to go for a walk. Now people ask a lot, why are they called giant pandas? What other panda species are there? Now originally, we did have the red panda and the giant panda, and we actually thought that they were related. However, through genetic research, we actually found that they're not really related at all. In fact, the red panda is actually more closely related to that of the raccoon. However, they are a bear species giant pandas. We do have the two, two uh, different kinds. We have reds and giants. They're definitely not related. Just eating a new piece there. You actually see that he does uh, tear off the green part there and generally do tend to like the inside of the palm or some of the bamboo better. And notice that he actually does put it towards the back of his mouth so he has additional teeth and it has the largest proportional uh, teeth size. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. My name is Emily and I'm just uh, by the rock structure. Again, this is our male down mouth. Urshan is actually inside today for right now. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. It's an ostrich, right? Oh, Emu. 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 It is. Wow. Yeah. Look at those kangaroos. Look at how long their back legs are. And they're Look not hopping. That. It looks kind of uncomfortable. Oh.
I wish I could go on top of those rocks there. Yeah, they eat you. one. He would talk you. It is a dollar. Hold on, hold on. Okay, really cool.
seriously. I could spend all day filming these guys. Got here at the right time.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Desiree and I'm here to feed the cheetahs. I'm not the cheetah keeper today but we're a little short staffed so we're, you'll see a lot of us everywhere today. Um, I have two boy cheetahs out here and I'm going to throw them a bone each. Uh, if they come over, we'll see. They're starting to maybe come over. So I have a male out here named Zeke, and I have a male out here named Bomani. Normally we have one cheetah out here at a time, because that's what happens in the wild. Uh, but these guys can actually be out here as two males, which is a normal behavior in the wild. So sometimes you'll see two male cheetahs or two male lions hanging out by themselves. And that's what we basically call a coalition. It's often two brothers. These are not brothers, but in the wild it could be two brothers. Uh, and they would actually help each other. So here's the... Come on! Come on, Bo! So the guy right here, Zeke, uh, he's a 10-year-old male, and the guy coming in behind who's a little bit smaller with a more teddy bear-like face, his name is Bomani, and he's five. Bomani, this guy here, was actually born here as part of our breeding program. Uh, Zeke was not, but he was brought here to be a breeding male. So you only see two, to, two cheetahs out here, but we actually have quite a few cheetahs between here and a holding that is off view from the public. Um, these are really hard animals to breed, but very important animals to breed due to their status. Uh, they're notoriously difficult to breed both in captivity but also in the wild, so it's not related to captivity. It's actually just related to the fact that most che cheetahs are genetically related. So, um, years and years and years ago, uh, there was actually a small population of cheetahs, um, and that's all that was left uh, due to natural occurrences. So nothing to do with people, they're just what we call a bottleneck. So most cheetahs are actually quite well related. Um, uh, so what's basically what would happen if I took a skin transplant from one cheetah and put it on another, there's generally like a 95% acceptance rate, um, even from an Africa here and an, or a cheetah here or a cheetah in Africa. And so they're pretty, pretty closely related, which causes them to have a lot of reproductive issues. So in captivity, we do a program here where we allow them to sometimes naturally breed but also between our zoos and other zoos, we also do artificial insemination. Uh, we haven't had babies in quite a while. Most of our female cheetahs, unfortunately, are past reproductive age. We have one that's sort of left on the verge, um, but she hasn't produced a baby yet for us, so we're not sure if she will. Uh, so we'll try one last time. Um, but if you go down the road just to African Lion Safari, they have some of our babies from some of our past litters, and they also participate in a breeding program, and we exchange animals back and forth. Um, and that's how it works in North American zoos. So we look at the genetics of each cat and we go who would actually do well to breed with another one to keep them as varied as possible. They're yawn, eh?
behind the glass, okay? We can't get you.